friends, to a very rainy and chilly day on the homestead Monday morning. This week, Mrs. W and I are going to kind of finalize our preparations for what I fear is going to be another COVID lockdown coming this fall or this winter, December, January, something like that. I. Deluge of data. This project will make extensive use of supercomputer models designed to simulate periods in cosmic history.
everyone, how are you today? I hope you all are healthy. By the way, I want to share an article that I just read, a pretty interesting article for us to discuss today. This article entitled, Triumph of the Pod People, What the 2020 Election Really Means, was written by Boyd D. Cathy. Please give a response to this article in the comment section. Without further ado, let's get started. This is Davos. Friends, when I was a boy, scarcely out of the first grade, there was released a film, now a cult movie, titled, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, in 1956. Although my parents would let my sister and me, go occasionally to the old Ambassador Theatre, or the Colony Theatre in Raleigh, usually with friends, or accompanied by either, or both of them, that was one film which was strictly off-limits. We could attend a Saturday Western double bill, or maybe something like Friendly Persuasion, with Gary Cooper, or The Ten Commandments, but nothing eerily bizarre that might produce childhood nightmares. Besides, my sister and I were probably too young to get in, given the old Hollywood code. Still, that movie was the subject of a lot of conversation. And much of it, centered on the famous pod people at the center of the film's plot. Those extraterrestrial beings who were transported to Earth as vegetable pods, and who eventually took over the bodies of sleeping, unaware human beings, and possessed them, turning them essentially into robotic creatures who continued to look like real humans but weren't. We had great fun pretending from time to time to be pod people back then. That imagery has vividly come to mind in recent days, indeed increasingly since the election 2016, and now even more so, since November 3, 2020. With all the growing discussion of two Americas, of a country, our geographical entity, irreconcilably divided in which not only interests, values and beliefs radically and sharply differ, but inhabitants can no longer communicate, even though they supposedly speak the same language, that imagery of six decades ago, becomes more a fulfilled prophecy than science fiction, even if only impressionistically. No, certainly I am not accusing the minions and followers of the progressivist left, of being extraterrestrial interlopers. But I do suggest that the virus of a highly contagious, post-Marxist venom in our culture has infected millions of our fellow citizens and exacted a tremendous toll that it has been percolating for many decades in our institutions, oftentimes just below the surface, that its initial target was our educational system and media, and that its major accomplishment has been to persuade us to accept as undeniable dogmatic truth, the idea of irreversible and steadily advancing progress, which itself appointed heralds and standard bearers, continuously proclaim and update as they see fit you know the drill just take for instance the institution of marriage from being a holy sacrament indissoluble between one man and one woman our society has progressed from that traditional christian doctrine first it was secularized then came easy and widespread divorce now same-sex marriage is a constitutional right and beyond why not polygamy do not the laws forbidding it also deny my human and constitutional rights there are countless other examples, but I submit they are usually advocated and eventually accomplished in the name of equality and human rights, but always subsumed under the idea of progress, that society must move forward, not just materially but intellectually. And that inevitably means leftward. Anything or anyone who stands in its way must be thwarted, cancelled, and eventually forbidden to write and speak. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. What? In 2016, an upstart millionaire businessman, named Donald J. Trump, upset that Apple car just a bit, not that he knew what he was actually doing, not really. But his instincts and his intuition were mostly right, and like millions of us, out in what left-wing novelist Philip Roth once called flyover country, that expanse of America, between New York's Upper East Side and Silicon Valley and San Francisco, Trump sensed that something was wrong in our democracy, that in the name of social justice and equality, this country had devolved into a stratified neo-plantation system in many ways, more rigid and more inhuman than anything my ancestors in antebellum North Carolina ever envisaged, or would have ever countenanced. I doubt that the Donald had ever read James Burnham's classics on the evolving dominance of what he termed the managerial elite or class over American life, and assuredly he hadn't peeked into Samuel Francis's texts, developing the same topic, for example, Leviathan and its enemies, etc. Nor had most Americans. 
but the fact is that today, in our democracy, the country is basically divided more or less into three classes. 1. A highly selective and controlling managerial class, composed mostly of corporate tech millionaires and their minions, from Silicon Valley, hedge funders on Wall Street, the academic and media elites, brainwashed millennials and soccer moms, and deep state political pawns and dependents buried deep in government. 2 a broad middle class that ends up footing the bill for the corporate class and enduring its divinely proclaimed ukases and rules of conduct that only seem to affect the deplorables and chumps who live in middle America, never in those gated million dollar estates in San Jose or luxurious penthouses in Manhattan. 3. And lastly, a growing dependent class who are generally bought off by the beguiling promises of the managerial class and the goodies that are promised them. The past four years, the first term of President Trump awakened among many hitherto mostly regular citizens an understanding that the old republic in which they had lived and raised their families was quickly slipping away. Trump, however imperfect he was, was seen as a kind of bull in the china shop, someone who would force the agents of the deep state and its machinations, and the role of the managerial elites in our lives, out into the light of day. For those of us in the hinterland this comprehension was not always that clear. Yet, among the big tech, big media, big academia apparatchiks and deep state managerial class, they understood far better what was at stake. Their masks had been partially ripped off, and what we began to behold were, modern pod people, in every way they looked like us, but now forced out into the open, to protect their positions and authority, they were increasingly revealed as radically different, programmed, as it were, like pod people from outside our universe, determined to control every aspect of our lives, and regain lost power. Often those of us who reject the idea of progress and the proposals of its fanatical votaries are labeled racists or misogynists or defenders of historic white supremacy, facile epithets intended to shame and silence us. Since the November 3 election, those of us who question its legitimacy, who have noted multiple, literally hundreds of examples of mass fraud and manipulation of the vote, are labeled conspiracy nuts, running to and fro sporting tinfoil hats, spouting outlandish and bizarre theories. Yet those theories are not outlandish and bizarre if they are true. And the mounting evidence, and that is what it is, evidence, is more than convincing. Those who demand our submission, our obeisance, to their claim, that this election is over, that there was little or no fraud and abuse, who refuse to even examine the evidence, are engaged in gaslighting and projection. They accuse us, as the neoconservative honcho, Jonah Goldberg, does consistently on Fox, of failing to acknowledge reality. Yet it is they, like G.K. Chesterton's unfettered bird out of its natural nesting place, who have turned much of America into something outside the laws of God and of nature. It is they who have created their own unreality, the swamp of lunacy which bids to overwhelm us. And that we cannot, and will not permit to happen, even if we must for a time endure in modern catacombs. To quote the president of the Confederacy Jefferson Davis, Truth crushed to earth is truth still, and like a seed, will rise again. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. This discussion may be late to discuss, but there is something interesting that you should know here. So, let's get started. Taco Bell released a couple of ads entitled Illuminati, which feature a creepy secret society and a flurry of Illuminati symbolism. Is this a case of brilliant marketing, or is the elite flaunting its power in plain sight? Taco Bell is mostly known for its cheap diarrhea-inducing, pseudo-Mexican food. Indeed, it is the best place to be to eat delicious grade F mystery meat, topped with mouth-watering American cheese-flavored melted food product. Oh, the joys of hearing one's stomach rumbling after only a few bites of Doritos-flavored tacos, these desperate calls for help from a distressed digestive system, these warning signs of an upcoming bathroom cyclone. Indeed, it does not take long for a healthy stomach to realize that this influx of taco meat is actually poisonous, and, in an attempt to preserve general health, sends everything flying out the rear end. This mild inconvenience does not stop millions of customers from stopping at their local restaurant and ordering a mountain tacos. 
Hardcore K, might you ask? Well, this is where the poo-poo jokes stop and things get real. Taco Bell is not a joke, it is part of a gigantic tentacular mega corporation that feeds a great portion of the world. And those who own it are extremely powerful. Taco Bell is part of Yum Brands, a mega corporation that also owns KFC, Pizza Hut, and Wing Street. The company's LinkedIn page boasts. As the world's largest restaurant company, Yum Brands Incorporated has over 43,500 restaurants in more than 135 countries and territories, and more than 1.5 million associates worldwide. The company's brands, KFC, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell, are the global leaders of the chicken, pizza, and Mexican-style food categories. This is a banner promoting Yum Brands found on the company's LinkedIn page. It literally says that it is feeding the world. This picture is featured right on Yum Brands homepage. One I sign equals a lead owned. Taco Bell's parent company is 100% owned by the world elite. Its owners are part of supranational elite organizations such as the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Bilderberg Group. The company's gigantic budget, political influence, and stronghold on agricultural production strongly influence how food is produced and how people are fed. This is an excerpt from a book entitled Political Economy and Global Capitalism, the 21st Century, Present and Future. The degree of concentration in the fast food industry means that corporations can assert a great deal of control over prices of inputs and outputs, and therefore, profits. For example, farmers and ranchers in the US find themselves getting third world prices for their products. This is because giant food processing companies can impose low prices on the direct producers, because government subsidies keep farmers afloat, and because an increasing share of the total value of the food goes not to the primary producers, but to the middlemen and those who carry out the ever greater processing of food. Since humans tend to crave sugar, fat and salt, value-added processing essentially means the addition of inexpensive but semi-addictive inputs. The profits of the food processors increase dramatically, as people become addicted to ever greater quantities of food high in empty calories. Yet, Americans continue to eat fast foods. Is it because they are unaware of the impact of fast foods on the health of humans and the environment? This is perhaps one reason, but here are some others. Food with a lot of fat, sugar, caffeine and salt tastes good and or alters moods to the point of being mildly addictive. Eating habits are formed at a young age, and the marketing and advertising of the fast food industry have targeted the young. People with low incomes can often only afford fast foods. The pace of life requires people to eat on the run. Fast food restaurants are everywhere and often monopolize certain spaces such as sports venues, expressway fuel stops, schools, airports, and suburban malls, giving one little choice. The flow of fast food advertising is relentless. Food cravings are heightened by antidepressants, which are now widely used. The inner emptiness that accompanies consumerism can be conveniently filled by omnipresent fast food. Therefore, as Taco Bell ads make fun of conspiracies about elite groups controlling the world, the company's owners are actually part of an elite group controlling the world. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. At the beginning of this decade, a generation of people discovered that the symbols surrounding them, actually bear a deep symbolic meaning, and revealed the true nature of those in power. This simple very verifiable truth brought a new era of public awareness and a new taste for research and truth seeking. Of course, the elite hated everything about this. It did not take long before mass media pawns muddied the waters and turned all research concerning the occult elite into a dumbed down cartoonish joke. The campaign worked as planned. The word Illuminati, which has been around for centuries to describe an actual secret society, is now automatically associated with stupid memes by most people. The Illuminati commercials are a continuation of that interview. The ads use actual facts, symbols, and concepts associated with the elite to turn them into a joke while selling $1 garbage to the masses. Let's look at what is going on there. First, the Illuminati logo is the Taco Bell logo inside a triangle. The logo addresses the several years old theory that the inside of the bell is actually a reptilian eye. This is an old meme about the logo. 
The ad begins by showing a weird old guy with glowing eyes. The old man is a transhuman, a human merged with a robot. Transhumanism is an important part of the elite agenda. The transhuman scans the bill, highlighting a pattern above the Federal Reserve seal on the bill. Also, the Taco Bell eye appears on the face of George Washington. Inside, the Illuminati meeting place is filled with masked and hooded figures and is similar to eyes wide shut type balls the elite love to host. The party looks like an Illuminati themed music video, complete with a logo projected on a red drape. There's a person wearing a sunray crown, reminiscent of esoteric iconography, and, to the left, a horned animal head that is somewhat reminiscent of Baphomet. Also, they're eating burritos. Hope the bathrooms are close by. Here, mysterious people in red cloaks overlook a hologram of the Earth, implying that they're secretly ruling the world. The ceiling design above the globe forms a six-pointed star, Achaia the Star of David, Achaia the Seal of Salomon. Prominently featured at the ball is a striking painting of George Washington doing the rock sign popularized by Jay-Z. The rock sign is often mentioned on my previous videos as it represents an attachment to the occult elite. This is Jay-Z doing the rock sign with his eye inside the triangle, effectively forming the Illuminati symbol. The rock is short for Rockefeller, one of the most prominent families of the world elite. The sign also appears in strange, non-rock-related places, such as this picture of Gloria Steinheim and a pro-abortion campaign. The hand sign is known as Kohenim Hands of Priestly Blessing in Judaism. One might think, lol, they made George Washington throw the rock sign, that's funny, and there's nothing more to it, lol. Yes, this is indeed hilarious. I choked on my burrito when I saw that. However, George Washington was actually a high-level Freemason, and most of the art representing him is replete with Masonic symbolism. This painting shows the engraving George Washington as a Freemason, features the US first president, surrounded by every single Masonic symbol known to man. Although the Washington painting is a joke, it is also not a joke. He was actually a high-ranking member of a prominent secret society. His entire life and legacy were deeply influenced by Masonic principles. Here's another item that is deeply influenced by Masonic principles, the Great Seal of the United States. The commercial shows the unfinished pyramid on the dollar bill, highlighting each step with words such as tortilla. The shot pokes fun at the theory surrounding the number of steps on the pyramid. Regular people watching this ad might think, lol, at these conspiracy theorists counting the steps on the pyramid. Well, these people get their education from Taco Bell ads, books written by knowledgeable people do exist, and they clearly explain the meaning of these symbols. Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree mason and prominent occultist, describes the Great Seal of the United States. European mysticism was not dead at the time the United States of America was founded. The hand of the mysteries controlled the establishment of the new government, for the signature of the mysteries may still be seen on the Great Seal of the United States of America. The significance of the mystical number 13, which frequently appears upon the Great Seal of the United States, is not limited to the number of the original colonies. The sacred emblem of the ancient initiates, here compassed of 13 stars, also appears above the head of the eagle. The motto, E Puribus Anum, contains 13 letters, as does also the inscription, Anud Coeptus. The eagle clutches in its right talon a branch, bearing 13 leaves and 13 berries, and in its left a sheaf of 13 arrows. The face of the pyramid, exclusive of the panel containing the date consists of 72 stones arranged in 13 rows once again the ad pokes fun at people who actually know about their own history the goal of every marketing person is to create ads that become viral and that get people talking taco bell obviously succeeded and yes this video adds to the discussion however there is more at stake here Lots of commercial spots made by major brands do not simply sell a product, they sell the agenda of those who own the companies. For years, there has been an obvious mass media agenda to discredit all Illuminati type research and to ridicule those who discuss it. Furthermore, there's a clear effort to spread disinformation to make the entire subject utterly confusing. The Taco Bell ads are part of this agenda. By mashing together various Illuminati symbols with taco-related jokes, the ads fictionalize the entire subject, causing regular, unaware people to associate everything that was depicted in the ads as pure fantasy. 
Furthermore, under the guise of ridicule, the ads actually expose the masses to more of the symbolism that's been highlighted on this channel for years, shamelessly putting it in plain sight and making it part of popular culture. In short, the Taco Bell ads are diarrhea for the mind. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This everything inside me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy. The U.S. economy has been on the verge of collapse for at least a decade, ever since the crash of 2008 and the subsequent explosion in fiat stimulus from the Federal Reserve. While the mainstream media has always claimed that central bankers saved us from another Great Depression, what they actually did was set us up for a far worse scenario, a stagflationary implosion of our society. Here is the primary problem. By injecting trillions of bailout dollars into the system, the Federal Reserve prevented the economy from going through its natural purging cycle. This cycle would have been painful for many, but survivable, and it would have removed large amounts of excess debt, parasitic corporations that produce little or nothing of use, as well as numerous toxic assets with no legitimate value. For a real free market to function, weaker corrupt elements must be allowed to fail and die. Instead, central banks around the world and most prominently the Fed, kept all of those destructive elements on life support. This has created what amounts to a zombie economy. A system that needs constant outside support or stimulus in order to continue moving forward. In the process of keeping zombie corporations and other parts of the body alive, healthy parts of the economy, like the small business sector, get devoured. The zombie economy is, however, highly fragile. All it takes is, one or two major shocks to bring it down, and the moment this happens, the whole facade will disintegrate, leaving the public in panic and disarray. This is what is happening right now in 2020, and it will get much worse in 2021. Bailouts encourage and reward unhealthy financial behavior, and this is why national debt, corporate debt and consumer debt, have recently hit historic highs. When every pillar of the economy is encumbered with a weight of debt, any instability has the possibility of bringing all those pillars down at once. The Federal Reserve turned the US into an economic time bomb, and the Fed is itself more like a suicide bomber than some kind of fiscal savior. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. I first heard the term Global Reset, or Great Reset, back in 2014-2015. I made a video about how the reset was actually a long-term process. Christine Lagarde was the head of the IMF back then, and she mentioned it briefly in multiple interviews. I made a mental note of it because it seemed planted into the discussion very awkwardly, as if it was scripted. I rarely heard it mentioned for years after that. In 2020, as we descend into social and economic chaos, I'm seeing the phrase used everywhere in the media and by globalists. Over the past decade, globalist institutions have come up with numerous phrases that seem to refer to a worldwide planned and dramatic shift in human society, sometime in the near future. The Great Reset is just another phrase for the New World Order. It is important to understand that the reset these people are talking about has actually been engineered and staged for many years. This is not something that just popped up in 2020, they have been talking about it since at least 2014. And before that, they talked about the New World Order and multilateralism and the multipolar world order and Agenda 2030, etc. 
The reset is the catalyst phase of an agenda that has been in the works for a long time now. The goal, as they have openly admitted many times, is to centralize the entire Earth into one monetary structure, one highly interdependent and socialized economy, and eventually one faceless and unaccountable governing body. One of the biggest obstacles to the finalization of the reset and the formation of the new world order has been liberty-minded populations across the Earth, most of all, the liberty-minded people within America. The U.S. has to be destabilized or eliminated, the old world order has to be brought down before the new world order can be introduced. The people have to be beaten down and desperate, so that when the globalists offer their reset as the solution, the people will gladly accept it without question, simply because they want the economic pain and uncertainty to stop. A common statement made by globalists from Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum to the current Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, is that the CV-19 pandemic is the perfect opportunity to trigger the Great Reset. As globalist Rahm Emanuel is famous for admitting, in crisis, there is opportunity to do things you were not able to do before. In other words, when people panic in the face of crisis, they become easy to manipulate. And, if a crisis doesn't happen naturally, then why not create a crisis from thin air, and use that to cause panic? The lockdowns have not only been proven to do nothing to stop the spread of the CV-19, but they are also a clear attack on what's left of our economic system. The small business sector, in particular, is being gutted as more than 60% of those that shut down during the first lockdown were unable to reopen. Small businesses provide more than half of all employment in the U.S. When they collapse, the U.S. economy will have nothing left except the big box corporations that the Fed put on life support over a decade ago. Real unemployment, which is already at 26%, will skyrocket even further if a second national lockdown is initiated. The speedy collapse of the U.S. economy will be assured, and the Great Reset can commence. At least, that is what the globalists want to happen. With the U.S. presidential election currently being contested, it is hard to say how the next few months will play out in detail. As I have been pointing out since July, a contested election is the best possible scenario for the globalists, because it creates a catch-2-2 situation. 1. If Trump stays in office, the political left will accuse him of usurping the presidency, and there will be mass riots in the streets. Conservatives will be tempted with the idea of bringing in martial law to suppress rioters, and such measures will undermine the flow of the U.S. economy, causing its fragile structure to implode. 2. If Biden enters the White House, then he will attempt a level 4 lockdown, similar to the lockdowns we have seen in Australia, France, Germany and the UK, perhaps even worse. Our economy will crumble, conservatives will revolt, and Biden will attempt martial law measures. Either way, the globalists get their crisis, and they're in their opportunity. where things get less certain for the elites. If liberty-minded Americans organize immediately for security and mutual aid, we can defuse the catch-2-2. If we provide for our own security within our own communities, there will be no rationale for Trump to institute martial law. Community security is an awesome deterrent against leftist rioting and looting, and basic economic trade can continue. By extension, if we organize our own community security as well as localize our economies with barter and trade, we also act as a deterrent to Biden and any ideas he might have of enforcing national lockdowns. The point is, we can't allow the globalists to dictate the terms of the crisis. We must act to change the rules of the game. The reset is not a natural inevitability, it is a calm, a trap. No matter how bad the crisis in our nation becomes, it is the people, namely the liberty-minded people, who will determine the future, not the globalists. Their plan relies on our panic. Instead of panic, let's show them a unified front and a plan of our own. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. Always appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This Everything Inside Me channel. See you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.
Although marketed as a song about global warming, the video of All Good Girls Go to Hell contains symbols and references alluding to a darker spiritual message. Here's the deeper meaning of All Good Girls Go to Hell. Billie Eilish is currently the most popular and influential pop star in the world. If you're asking yourself, Billy who, then you're probably not a 14-year-old girl. Because nearly all 14-year-old girls know about Billie Eilish. Indeed, she's the current teen idol that's pictured on the cover of all teen magazines, plastered all over social media, and discussed on all gossip sites. Undeniable proof of Eilish's popularity can be found on YouTube, as her video, All the Good Girls Go to Hell, amassed over 13 million views and 140,000 comments in less than 24 hours. Billie Eilish is also earning great praise in the music industry, as she is deemed the future of pop by several prominent figures. While Billy's fans love the singer's unique style and persona, there is definitely nothing unique about the themes and the symbolism found in her videos. In my previous video about the disturbing meaning of Billy Eilish's Bury a Friend, I explained how Billy Eilish's entire act is based on the concepts of trauma-based mind control and pseudo-Satanism, themes that can be found in countless other music videos, released by countless other pop stars. In her music video, entitled, Bury a Friend, Billy is abused and drugged by unseen people, mind control handlers. She then shows signs of being possessed by a demon as she sings the words. For the dead I owe, gotta sell my soul. Cause I can't say no, no, I can't say no. Then my limbs all froze and my eyes won't close. And I can't say no, I can't say no. This is a screenshot from Bury a Friend. Billy looks out of it, and abused by unseen handlers. Following Bury a Friend, Eilish released Bad Guy, a colorful and humorous video, custom made to please young viewers. The song became a massive hit that quickly topped the charts, and made Billie Eilish a household name. Then, All the Good Girls Go to Hell, was released. And it was not colorful nor humorous. The video picks up, where Bury a Friend left off as it features Billie's mind-controlled and demon-possessed alter persona, singing from the perspective of Lucifer to the youth. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. The marketing surrounding All the Good Girls Go to Hell, claims that the song, is about global warming. The description of the YouTube video contains this note from Billy. A note from Billy. Right now there are millions of people all over the world begging our leaders to pay attention. Our earth is warming up at an unprecedented rate, ice caps are melting, our oceans are rising, our wildlife is being poisoned, and our forests are burning. On September 23rd, the UN will host the 2019 Climate Action Summit to discuss how to tackle these issues. The clock is ticking. On Friday, September 20th and Friday, September 27th, you can make your voice be heard. Take it to the streets. Hashtag climate strike. Most media sources also followed suit and praised the song's environmental message. However, as is often the case in mass media, the main message of the video is completely ignored. Indeed, one cannot watch the video without noticing the heavy-handed satanic undertones of the entire thing. While the song and the video do contain references to global warming, All the Good Girls Go to Hell is mainly an occult elite manifesto, where Billy plays the role of Lucifer himself. The video begins with a scene from Bury a Friend, which indicates that All the Good Girls Go to Hell is the sequel. Billy is stabbed with several needles by the unseen people who abused her in Bury a Friend. In Bury a Friend, the injections cause Billy to become demon-possessed, or something of the sorts. In All the Good Girls Go to Hell, things are taken to another level. After the injections, Billy grows massive wings on her back. Billy then falls from the sky. Billy Eilish is a fallen angel, the nickname of Lucifer. This scene appears to be inspired by the classic artwork, The Fall of Satan, by Gustav Dorr. 
This painting is The Fall of Satan by Augusta Dore, depicts Lucifer falling to earth after rebelling against God. The intro of the video provides the context needed to understand the rest of it. Billy is drugged by unseen people and ends up under the control of Lucifer. The first words of the song confirm this fact. My Lucifer is lonely. This enigmatic line refers to the classic image of an angel and a devil on a person's shoulder. By singing My Lucifer is Lonely, Billy indicates that there is no angel on her shoulder. Therefore, she is fully controlled by the devil. In the video, Billy's eyes reflect this state of control. Take a look on these pictures. Left, Billy and Barry a friend with black eyes. Right, Billy and all the good girls go to hell with the same black eyes. The black eyes indicate that her soul is possessed. The lyrics of the song come from the perspective of Lucifer singing through Billy. The first verse denigrates the concept of heaven, where good people are rewarded with eternal life. Standing there, killing time, can't commit to anything but a crime. Peter's on vacation, an open invitation. Animals, evidence. Pearly gates look more like a picket fence. Once you get inside them, got friends but can't invite them. The verse refers to St. Peter, who is said to be the guardian of heaven at the pearly gates. Those who are rejected are sent to hell. Billy sings that Peter is on vacation, meaning that the gateway to heaven is not guarded, and that anybody can rush in. However, in the next lines, Billy compares the pearly gates to a picket fence, which is often associated with the boring domestic life of suburban America. She adds that she cannot invite her friends in heaven, because, apparently, they're bound to hell. What kind of friends does she have? Oh right, people in show busyness. Well, Billy, this is heaven, hell is, on earth. As Billy walks down the street covered in oil, everything around her catches fire. Hell is on earth. The pre-chorus emphasizes this concept. Hills burn in California. My turn to ignore you. Don't say I didn't warn you. The line Hills burns in California is said to be a reference to the California wildfires which are blamed on global warming. Billy, aka Lucifer, sings that she won't do anything about it. She's actually glad this is happening. On a biblical level, the pre-chorus refers to Earth becoming hell, and she's actually glad this is happening. The chorus points at the powerlessness of God face to what is happening on Earth. All the good girls go to hell, cause even God herself has enemies, and once the water starts to rise, and heaven's out of sight, she'll want the devil on her team. In the song, God is referred to as female. The same concept was also exploited on Ariana Grande's song, God is Woman. It is a reversal of the traditional title, Heavenly Father given to God. Facing the threat of water rising on earth due to global warming, God is portrayed as helpless. She even asks the devil for help. In the second verse, Lucifer rejects pleas from God to help humanity. Look at you, needing me. You know I'm not your friend without some greenery. Walk in wearing fetters. Peter should know better. Your cover-up is caving in. Man is such a fool, why are we saving him? poisoning themselves now, begging for our help, wow. In this verse, Lucifer shows utter contempt for humanity, and is happy to see it destroy itself. Do you know who else is happy to see humanity destroy itself? The occult elite, those who control Billy, those who sing through her. They would love to see a massive depopulation of humanity. At one point, the trail of oil causes Billy's wings to catch fire. At the end of the video, the feathers on the wings are all burned off. Lucifer cannot fly anymore, and is here to stay. Also, notice the women dancing in Hellfire. Good girls are in Hell. After watching Earth turn into Hell, the song ends with these ominous words. My Lucifer is lonely. There's nothing left to save now. My God is gonna owe me. There's nothing left to save now. To sum up, Billie Eilish is drugged by those who control her. She turns into her black-eyed, demonic persona, and grows the wings of Lucifer. She descends to Earth, and, as fire spreads around her, she denigrates humanity, and laughs at the powerlessness of God. All the good girls go to hell, is a message from the occult elite to the masses. We enjoy seeing you become corrupt and die. The same feelings of hatred against humanity can be found in songs by other stars, such as Poppy and Madonna, both of them also love pseudo-satanic symbolism. 
and all the good girls go to hell. The Messenger is a mind-controlled, devil-possessed pop star who is used to push the elite's agendas, including the normalization of Satanism, the desecration of Christianity, and the using of fake global warming panic to cause fear and hatred against humanity. Controlled by Lucifer, the favorite biblical figure of the occult elite, Billy sings to her legions of young fans that it is cool to be evil because good girls go to hell. In short, all the good girls go to hell is less about the destruction of the earth and more about the destruction of the soul. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This Everything Inside Me channel. See you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy. Welcome back. President Trump made his first campaign trip yesterday since Election Day, and he made it, and he went to Georgia. Mr. Trump is supposedly working to re-elect Republican Senators David Perdue and Kelly Loeffler while focusing more on his baseless claims that Georgia's election system is rigged and that he won Georgia's 16 electoral votes. Well, that brought a spirited response this week from top Georgia election official, Republican Gabriel Sterling, directed at both Mr. Trump and fellow Republicans who have been repeating his falsehoods. It has to stop. This is the backbone of democracy, and all of you who have not said a damn word are complicit in this. Gabriel Sterling joins me now. Mr. Sterling, welcome to Meet the Press, sir. Morning, sir. Uh, I'm going to play for you something from the president last night uh, and get you to respond to it on the other side. Here's what he said about Georgia. We're all deeply disturbed and upset by the lying, cheating, robbing, stealing that's gone on with our elections. We know the Democrats will have dead people voting. They have people signing their own name over and over. They have, they have people signing names with the same pen, with the same signature. They don't even change because they know once they get it in, it'll never be looked at. It'll never be looked at again because of people like your Secretary of State and your Governor. Mr. Sterling, you had made an impassioned plea there that we just played that this has to stop. It doesn't look like he chose to stop. Is it, it, could you please debunk or um, what he said there when it comes to your role in the Georgia elections? It's at this point, it's, it's, it's a game of whack-a-mole, as we've been saying. The president's statements are false. There is information. They are stoking anger and fear among his supporters. And hell, I voted for him. The situation is getting much worse, and it's, it's an environment that's been built out over years. And it's not just, you know, Republicans on this side this time, but even in polling you know, up to 2019, up to 50% of Democrats think Russians flipped votes on machines. So this is going both ways. It's undermining democracy. We've got to get to a point where responsible people act responsibly. Well, I'm just curious, um, what was it that sparked your decision to come out um, uh, as, uh, as you know, to come out as direct as you came out earlier this week. Was there a specific incident or incidents that have been happening to you or others? It wasn't happening. I mean, obviously, I have a police car outside my house right now. I can see it out the right side of my first world vision. There has been police protection for the secretary. His wife received sexual and violent uh, threats on her personal cell phone. But what, for lack of a better word, set me off on Tuesday it was about an hour before, an hour and a half before a previously scheduled news conference, I got a call from the project manager from Dominion Voting Systems for out of Colorado, who was telling me in a very audibly shaken voice that one of their contractors had received some threats um, in Gwinnett County. And this is just a young tech. He took a job a few weeks ago. He's one of the better ones. And one, I was going through the Twitter feed on it, and I saw it basically had the young man's name, which is a very unique name, so they tracked down his family and started harassing them. And it said, his name, you have committed treason, may God have mercy on your soul, with a slowly swinging noose. And at that point, I just said, I'm done. You know, uh, you said something else earlier this week. You said, let's face it, Senator Leffler and Senator Perdue were forced by President Trump to ask for my boss, Secretary Raffensperger's re resignation. The implicit threat was that he would do two tweets and torpedo their campaigns. Um, do you stand by those comments? Do you really believe that Leffler and Perdue um, essentially had to do what Trump said? They There's nothing else to make. 
since because even their staff were surprised when they put that out. You know, it was it's been about a week and a half, I guess, since the election had been over. And to say one of the things they said is that, it, that we were not transparent. We were literally doing two press conferences a day and sending out hourly press releases on the count. Nobody has any specific allegation. They just want to keep the Trump supporters whipped up because they think that's the best path to win the Senate races. I personally think by doing what I had asked and stepping up and saying, you know, this disinformation has to stop, these potential intimidations and violence has to stop, they would get more votes rather than less. And I'm still supporting it. We have to. I'm a Republican. We need to hold on to the Senate, so I'm still going to vote for them. But I'm not happy with how they conducted themselves in this particular situation. I was going to ask there. I mean, I, look, you, you seem to be somebody that, you know, you, you want to be viewed uh, as somebody who has the highest ethics, highest integrity, particularly in a position that you're in right now with when it comes to overseeing elections, helping to oversee elections. Um, do you believe that these folks running as Republicans right now have the same ethical standards that you have? Well, that's going to give me an easy question, Chuck. I mean, politics is a complicated profession. I said that earlier this week, too. And the values and the things we have to fight for, sometimes it gets to be complicated and difficult. I said something difficult on Tuesday to people who are in a position of responsibility who I would hope would show a higher sense of leadership and duty. But at the end of the day, I believe that their opponents would do more damage to this country than they would on, on this particular front on that particular day. Yeah. Do you regret your vote for President Trump now? Well, I can say one thing. I would have been a lot happier if it had been 13,000 votes the other way in the state. My life would have been a lot easier. But considering how he's behaved, does it? Do, do, you, do, you, do you ask yourself, hmm, maybe he isn't the right person to lead the country, at least if this is what he's going to do to the democracy? I think that, that we have this on all sides. This, that President Trump has a higher sense of responsibility. should be held to a higher standard. But we have a governor candidate in this state who still have not seen it. We have people, like I said earlier, I believe Russians switched votes. I mean, all sides, Republican and Democrat, have to stand up and do a better job. The president included and especially. Um, do you believe uh, that the president is doing damage to the Republican Party in Georgia by continuing yes. to stir this pot? Do you think it could cost Leffler and Purdue their Senate races? Yes. When, when he and his lawyers and then even his former lawyers, some of his former lawyers are literally saying, don't vote. It's mis-messaging. It's confusing. And if you're telling people don't trust the election system, why would they bother to show up? I mean, the best argument for some people is if you think they're stealing it, show up and vote to make it at least a little bit harder for them to steal. Gabriel Sterling, um, uh, who, again, uh, over helps to oversee the election system there, working for the Secretary of State. You spoke out pretty, uh, uh, pretty hard this week. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspective with us, sir. Thank you, Chuck. I wish I had to do it. Hello from Washington, I'm Chuck Todd, and thanks for checking out the Meet the Press channel on YouTube. Click on the button down here to subscribe and click over here to watch the latest interviews, highlights, and other digital exclusives. Son of a bitch. That is not what I watched earlier. Joining me now is the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator. Conspicuous red color has fascinated man for thousands of years. By the end of 2018, there were eight active spacecraft either orbiting or investigating the surface of Mars. There are also private groups that boast they will be building the first colony on the surface of Mars. It's a human obsession that drives scientists. This is Dabu 7. We now have the sheriff of California's fourth largest county slamming Governor Gavin Newsom for his most recent COVID-19 lockdown orders. He goes on to state that him and his men will not be blackmailed. They will not be bullied. They will not be used as muscle against the residents that they were there to serve and protect. And this is the question that I've been presenting over and over. And I'll say it again here now for every cop, for every person that took an oath out there military, whatever, did you take an oath to serve and protect the government or the people? You need to take a good look in the mirror and figure that one out because it seems they've got a lot of people in a roost when they say, oh, you're going to serve and protect your country. Ah, is that the word that they used? So what is your country? Is it the government or is it your people? Because this man is making a stand for the people. And I don't want to hear it no more from anyone out there that says, we don't know what to do. We don't have a white knight. We don't have anything. 
Well, when a man like this puts his neck on the line and stands up, I find out wow. you're in his area and you, you're sitting there complaining and you didn't get out and support a man like this, shame on you. Just that simple. This man is making a stand for the people. There's no excuse. If I was out in California, I'd be making it a point this weekend, whenever, to go down and meet with this guy. Do you understand that? How many people are just going to sit on their couch and sit on their ass and make an excuse and not do that? You keep making excuses, you're going to let it all wash away. So keep slacking and let it keep on washing away. For those of you that rise to the moment, I salute you. For all of you that stand on these front lines in this battle that we are in, I salute all of you. For all of you that lose your life in this battle, I will see you on the other side. I salute you. For everyone that stands for righteousness and freedom, and for everything that we were supposed to represent, I salute all of you. And for all of you that sit there, karma's coming. So, once again, I don't want to hear from anyone that's in California saying you don't have a way, there's no one to rally behind. I'm going to ask, well, what did you do this past week? What did you do in your off day? Did you go and you meet this guy, talk to him, meet with some real individuals to get behind? Because if you didn't, you're just all talk. That's all a lot of people are, is all talk. They don't get out here and they don't do nothing. But when someone does get out here and do something, you got to give them their props. So salutes to this officer, to all the other sheriffs across the country making this stand, to all the militiamen, to all the real vets that are standing up to protect us, to all the real patriots out there, I salute you. I love all of you. Join me on the next live stream over here on DLive. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. It's going down. Links below. This is Dabu7. Lots of people out there concerned about what's happening all around us, and rightfully so. But one thing is starting to become clear. In many areas, it seems that the governments and those pushing these vaccines are saying that they're not going to mandate it. So what this does is it falls back onto the companies. All the ones that are connected to the establishment, you know, all your big corporations, your McDonald's, your Walmarts, all your big name, name brand places. They're going to be telling all employees, no vaccine, no work. This is the choice that many people are going to have to make here in the offing. And if you have not realized right now, the healthcare workers in many different sectors in which we've talked about, they've been targeted to get this first. We also have other companies jockeying for position here to try to get their place designated as essential. Anyone that is listed as essential is going to have a better chance to get this jab faster. So when it comes to essential jobs out there and travel and all this, you better start thinking long and hard about where this is going. There's no secret about what's happening here. Everybody gets it and sees what's going on. Some are just trying to go along with the flow while others are making the stand. Every country is different. Every state's different. Every city's different on what's going to happen. And within areas where they're enforcing some, some things that people do not agree with, you do see others with authority standing up like sheriffs and others saying that they're not going to go against tyrannical stuff. So it's a back and forth, left and right. There's a, a whole series of different vaccines being used out here. If you missed it, Russia's vaccine is a whole different kind than the mRNA that's being rolled out here in mass through Moderna and other places. But this is a huge, huge test on everyone right here on whether they're going to do this. And to me, it falls into the same bucket as the flu vaccine that people try to go out and get every year. Ultimately, this comes down to each person having to make this decision on what they're going to do. But to me, personally, anyone comes to me and says, you're going to have to take a jab for the job, see ya, is my response. We'll see who is made of what, who stands for what, and who's about what from here. Because everyone had talked all that talk and said this and that. We're about to see the choices that you make. And don't ask me why I don't want nothing to do with you in the offing once it's been done. Okay? Because to me, anyone that will line up for this, this is the precursor to the mark. 
It'd be the same people, the same attitude, the same falling in line, towing the line, going right along with it. And the rest of us out here that see it, we ain't having that. Ain't having no mark of the beast. So have fun with all that and losing your soul in the process. If you want to know more about that, follow me over here on DLive. I break it down Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern. There's a lot you haven't been taught and told about what you are and where we go from here, if you would like to know. This is Tabu 7. We have Biden now saying that he will not force Americans to take the vaccine. But I want to warn everybody that most of the world leaders right now are going to make this statement. They're going to say it's not going to be mandatory. They're going to push it on down to states and, and to lower people to make decisions. And they may not even mandate it. But what they're going to do is this. It's already the plan. They will say you cannot go about your life if you do not prove that you've got it. The chief medical officer in Canada just came out and said it flat out. You will not be able to go to the bars, restaurants, stadiums, anything, unless you prove with your, your certificate, your papers, please, that you've been vaccinated and that you're clean. So Biden going down the same path, saying, oh, we, we're not going to mandate it in all this stuff. But here's some things that they would do, okay? Number one, they could start to make your children have to take this before they go back to school. Number two, employers could insist that employees be vaccinated. And with this whole thing going on, you're, you bet you the government's going to back any employer that has any battle in a court of law against any employee against this. Matter of fact, most lawyers will say that they can't legally do it, but the mainstream's bringing on their fake experts to say different, and they're brainwashing the masses to believe whatever they say. Through that TV, I haven't had cable in years now. I suggest some of you put your money where your mouth is and you unplug. All you talk a bunch of crap, say you do this, do that, got a plan, going to do that, but you just keep on down the lemming path. Uh, of tuning on into the mainstream, then believing it after everything that you've been told. Uh, it's crazy. But the businesses would also require patrons to show proof of vaccination. So if you want to be a business, you think it's bad now that they're taking out little bars and bar and grills and shops and haircut salons, spying on them and threatening them and fines through the roof. You think this is bad now? You're just simply, they're not going to be in business in the future. This is going to drive people underground. It's already begun for people that are sleeping on it. It's already begun. What about your el eligibility here for a $1,500 stimulus check? Did you guys miss that one? That's right. They're not talking about giving any stimulus out now with this $908 billion that is talked about. Nope, it's not even in there. But you know what they're talking about. Betelman with the $1,500 stimulus check if they get the jab. Yeah. U.S. Rep. John Delaney, a Democrat from Maryland, is proposing this. And then finally, you just won't be able to travel without it. Can't you see what they did in the first wave of lockdown? Essential drivers, papers, essential, all this. It's obvious, man. I guess some people just fell asleep and thought it was all going to go away over the summer. No, it's back. This isn't going anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere until tyrants are locked away. And you're sleeping. You're living a pipe dream if you think anything otherwise. I truly see big time shifts happening in the offing. I truly see major, major things about to happen. Major. I'm talking life changing, life threatening, the whole nine. If you're interested in what we're doing to combat all this, make sure to join us for the live streams. It's the only place I can talk freely about it. With the gloves come off, over here on DLive, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern, it's all going down. So keep your head up, y'all. We are in a battle. Do not forget it. We're in a battle. I'm not just saying that. We're in a war. Do not forget it.
Tonight, the CDC's strongest guidance yet on masks as the coronavirus hits new record highs. The CDC's new call for universal mask wearing indoors as the U.S. for the second day in a row shatters records for deaths, new cases, and hospitalizations. Dr. Fauci, ahead of Christmas, warning we haven't yet seen the post-Thanksgiving surge. And millions in California headed for a new lockdown. Hospitals gearing up for the vaccine would take you inside to see the drills they're conducting ahead of the very first doses. Joe Biden's new warning saying without new COVID relief, we're in for a bleak future and what he just said about the Trump administration's vaccine strategy. President Trump sent to headline the first rally since his election loss ahead of the runoffs to decide control of the Senate as he wages a GOP civil war in Georgia. Firefighters injured as powerful winds fuel an explosive wildfire as we're tracking the first potential major nor'easter of the season. The historic step today toward ending the federal ban on marijuana and deck the halls 2020 style. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, everyone. The CDC is expanding its mask wearing recommendations to virtually everywhere outside the home tonight in an urgent effort to slow the skyrocketing number of COVID infections, hospitalizations, and deaths, all eclipsing ghastly records on a daily basis. Right now, health officials are focused on counting the days since Thanksgiving travel, timing what they expect to be a new wave of illness that could push hospitals over the edge. Miguel Almaguer has late details. Tonight, millions in the San Francisco Bay Area ordered back into lockdown told to stay home except for critical services and outdoor recreation. New restrictions as the country plunges deeper into crisis. The U.S. once again setting new single-day records for the number of Americans who lost their lives, became infected, and are hospitalized with COVID. The numbers in and of themselves are alarming. And then you realize that it is likely we'll see more of a surge as we get two to three weeks past the Thanksgiving holiday. And the thing that concerns me is that it butts right on the Christmas holiday as people start to travel and shop and congregate. Illinois, Texas, and Pennsylvania now reporting the three highest death tolls this week. President-elect Biden says he'll ask the public to wear a mask for 100 days to slow the spread. But Dr. Fauci warns masks may be needed longer. Now, it might be that after that, we're still going to need it, but he just wants it Everybody for a commitment for 100 days. In New Jersey, the governor called Florida Congressman Matt Gates a putz and a fool for ignoring social distancing guidelines and mask mandates at a recent fundraiser. Back in California, L.A. County alone reported more cases in a single day this week than 44 states. Hospitals are filling fast. With COVID claiming 278,000 lives in the U.S., long-term care facilities account for 40% of deaths. At this New Hampshire home, Martin Oppenheimer is among at least 15 residents to lose his life. I was married to him for 66 and a half years. I wasn't there. At the end, I couldn't hold him. I couldn't say goodbye. Tonight, for far too many families, the holidays will be filled with heartbreak. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. I'm Megan Fitzgerald in Arizona for a first look at how one major medical center is preparing to administer the vaccine. Our hope is that this is the beginning of the end of COVID. Dr. Tiffany Pankow is one of Honor Health's 15,000 medical workers in the first round of distribution. It's a chance for us to be able to vaccinate and protect our first of all our health care um, workers and our first responders. Dozens of volunteers in Phoenix today taking part in a practice drill in this parking lot. This is where it starts. Cars will stop here. They'll advance on to registration where volunteers will confirm their identity and make sure that they have an appointment that you're data This is where the Vaccinations will take place. The cars will pull up, their windows will go down, and they'll get a shot in the arm, just like they would at their doctor's office. You ready? It's just going to be a little tense. Engineers working on traffic patterns and timing down to the second. Officials here say they're prepared to administer a thousand doses a day as soon as the vaccine is approved, which could be as early as mid-December. After being vaccinated, they'll pull up here and be observed for 15 minutes to make sure they don't have any side effects. I didn't touch a thing. They have That's a reaction. Awesome. They're told to honk their horns. 
teams today simulating how they'd respond to those types of medical emergencies. We're just going to stand here and talk to you and kind okay. of continue to keep an eye on you. Oh, I didn't fucking touch the thing. It's so cool. Getting one step closer to changing the course of the virus. Megan Fitzgerald, NBC News, Phoenix. All right, let's talk about your financial health now. President-elect Biden calling the future very bleak and warning of a very dark winter if Congress doesn't pass more pandemic oh my God. for tens of millions of Americans. I don't now, watch the news. Fuck, the man. Vaccine st- oh. This is Tom Pusseva. I want to make a few things clear here with what's going on with the rollout of vaccines. In a separate video, I talk about what's happening in Russia. Even though they're beginning their campaign, next week they're saying that it's going to be voluntary to take it in Russia. In the UK, we had witnessed Bojo come out and say the same thing. He says it will be voluntary. It will not be mandatory. It says right here, will not be mandatory. He says, because that's just not how we do things. And I want you to remember those words for in the future from old Bojo. In the meantime, the minister, the UK minister here, warns Brits that they could be denied normal life without the vaccine. So oh. you're not going to be forced to take it. It's not going to be mandatory. But what's going to happen is those that do not take it or show that they're negative are going to be cut off from everything else. You see how this works? They're doing it in reverse. So they're, they're not going to say, okay, it's mandatory. They're just going to cut you off from doing anything else. Oh. You're going to be denied entry into bars, theaters, sporting events. If you cannot prove that you received vaccination against COVID-19. So they're not going to make it mandatory. They're just going to take away your right to do anything out in society if you don't Where do it. My... This is I what's happening. That. So be aware of any of these countries that are coming out throughout the following weeks oh. and saying, oh, it's not mandatory. It's not mandatory. On the back end, they already have it set up that you're not going to be able to do anything unless you can prove that you got it. So don't be fooled. This is the latest. I'm going to continue to update on this on the live stream. So make sure to join me. Going live Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. You'll find me on D Live exclusively. Link. This is Dabu7. We have a mayor out of LA County in California coming out and making statements in terms of people's freedoms and what he believes should be an act of domestic terrorism if you get caught not wearing your mask. So this is Lancaster, California's mayor, Rex Paris. These comments come as his small town of 156,000 located in northern Los Angeles County is in a county where they're saying that cases are skyrocketing. So we're seeing this all over the place. I'm saying numbers are rising, but yet we have seen the deaths fall off a cliff no one wants to even mention that. And, uh, well, it looks like tyranny is raining down all over the place, everywhere we look. So we watched Newsom come out and make these statements. Then Garcetti came out and made statements in L.A. about stay in your homes. It's time to cancel everything. And now this man stepping up saying, if it was up to me. Anybody not wearing a mask when they are out in public would be arrested. That's what this man thinks. So, I'm going to leave some information here to read up on, some other charts. But a heads up for these type of individuals in this area, their mentality, what they're trying to implement. This is Dabu7 taking a look here at some announcements that have come out today as we have one of Trump's lawyers, Jenna Ellis, stating on Fox News that they have been given permission by a Michigan judge to go in and to examine 22 different Dominion voting machines. So they have gotten a green light now for a forensic audit in this whole thing. You may recall Jenna Ellis, Rudy Giuliani, the top lawyers here for Trump. They also had Sidney Powell in there for a minute. She went off on her own little thing, but they're continuing this push. Now, it's not clear which of the several different election lawsuits 
this order originated from. I will update as I get any of that extra information, but this is what they're stating, that they're, they're allowed to go in and do this audit. We also have a big move being made here by Alito. He has moved up the deadline for the Supreme Court briefing in the Pennsylvania case, and this brings it within the safe harbor window to intervene, which is very interesting. I talked about when they assigned all these certain judges, Coney Barrett, Alito, all these judges to certain districts and areas. And I said, sit back and let's see what they do. Now they're making moves. So these are things to keep an eye on. I'll continue to update on this stuff. I'm going live as well Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern on DLive. So make sure to get over here and join us for these shows, censorship free, to where it's going down. You'll find links below in the description wow. box. Tonight, COVID hits another Trump insider, Rudy Giuliani, who's been on the... This is Dabu7. We have word of another massive breach here as thousands of files have been stolen from a NATO cybersecurity contractor. Now, when you're talking the top dogs here militarily around the globe, NATO having this massive force with all these countries attached to it. Well, this was based in Rome. This is where this Italian defense group, Leonardo, has posted up. It's one of the world's largest contractors and NATO is one of its big, big contracts that they've landed, one of their big customers. And when it comes to cybersecurity and everything going on out here, if these top dogs are getting hacked or getting information stolen from them, it's an issue. It shows if it can happen up there at that level, it can happen just about anywhere. Well, some of these former employees that left were able to go back and bypass the company's cybersecurity defenses. Then they stole massive amounts of data. So it wasn't like it was some offset group of hackers that came in and did this. These were guys that knew the inner workings of it, that left the company, basically still had the keys in their pockets, so to speak, and were able to get in. Now they're saying that they went after these guys in arrests, but it doesn't stop the fact that this breach was made and that this data was taken and they don't know who else could have gotten it. I don't know what all was in this data, but it just goes to show that this day and age, they're doing this left and right. And with people's names and information and social security numbers and all that stuff floating around out there, it's not good. But if they could have easily taken down this group that's connected to NATO, contracted to NATO, it could happen to anyone else. So I'll update if we get any more word on it. This has been Dabu7. Make sure to follow me also on DLive. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. It's going down over there. Links below. Tonight, the darkest days of the pandemic as the U.S. sets chilling new records. Dude, I'm, I don't... How do I get out of that algorithm, man? Fuck. Wait, 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 wait. But in December, oh, does it change? No, it changes on the 24th. The 24th, it changes to full Capricorn. Full Capricorn on the 25th, and it turns on the 21st, four days later. 
When the disconjunction happens, shut the fuck up. Oh, I had my breakthrough all right.
11 hours, really? You guys are assholes. Assholes. Fuego is in Guatemala. <sighs> Latest update, Sunday, December 6, 2020 at 1645. Roughed it to 15,000 feet. <sighs> wow. And this one just came in. <sighs> what? At... No ash cloud. What? Sabakaya. Peru. Sunday, December 6, 2020, 1630 UTC time. We have possible puff emission. Raventandor volcano erupted to 15,000 feet today. Raventandor is in Ecuador. Sunday, the six, Sunday, December 6th, 2020 at 1530. Raventandor erupted to 15,000 feet. Sangay volcano. Sangay is in uh, Ecuador. And it, Sunday, December 6th, 2020 at 1415. What? One minute off, huh? Erupted to 19,000 feet today. God damn. Popo. Popo. Mexico City. Latest update December 6, 2020 at 1345. Erupted to 25,000 feet today. Klavuska Volcano. Kamchaka Peninsula. Eruption at 12.06. Uh, extended reported. I don't know. Samakaya. It says it erupted at 25,000 feet today. Sawarski's Jaime Volcano. Is in Japan. Latest update: VA cloud unknown. Dukuno volcano erupted today at December 6, 2020, at 08:30 to 7,000 feet. I just had a curiosity. All. Oh. Uh oh, we are cracking lacking. Ridgecrest is there two hours ago. And a three point six eleven hours ago. I felt it that morning. This morning, it was like bam. I was like, "What the fuck was that?" Damn, Mexico is cracking though. 
Flying Fish Cove Crystal Island. Christmas Island. Where the hell is that at? Christmas Island? Look at that. Oaxaca, Oaxaca, Guerrero. Wait, wait. One, two, three, four. Six hours ago in Esmeralda. Oh, look at it. It's moving up the line. Wait, six hours ago? Two hours ago. And 11 hours ago.